Show the family, it's AJ here, back again. Um, Fresh Truth crew invited me to teach on the feast, and this is part one, uh, covering uh, Passover and unleavened bread. Uh, but we've also made an intro or summary video, so check that out if you haven't already. Otherwise, uh, come join me. Um, so essentially, we're looking through the feasts of Israel found in Leviticus chapter 23. We saw there in verse 1 and 2, um, God has set appointed times, appointed fixtures or appointments, a certain time during the year, each year, uh, to celebrate these feasts. Now, let's get into the word. Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 4 and 5. These are the appointed times of the Lord holy convocations, or holy feasts, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. Verse 5. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month, um, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So, right there we see the first month, fourteenth day, the first month in Israel uh, is called Nisan. And so, that's the fourteenth day of Nisan is Passover. Um, Hebrew word or Hebrew name for Passover is Hag HaPesach. Hag meaning feast and HaPesach meaning of Passover, feast of Passover. Um, Pesach is, yeah, Passover. Uh, there's also another name used, Hag Heaviv, um, which means feast of spring. Uh, now Aviv or Abib, what you might see in your word, uh, refers to the stage of ripening um, in the grain crops, and uh, specifically barley and wheat. Um, but it marks the point where the crop is developed uh, from an initial green soft stage to a more firm, uh, mature stage. And so what we see here as well um, is Passover is also linked with um, the spring harvest. Now, the origins of Passover we'll find in Exodus chapter 12. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me. Exodus uh, chapter 12, and we'll read through uh, verses 1 to 14, but I'll stop and um, point out some bits as we go. So uh, verse 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. So there again, um, it's the first month of the year is when this is going to happen. Verse 3 and 4. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now here's a bit that Fresh Truth audience might not relate to. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, that, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Basically saying, if your house is too small to eat a lamb, you have to team up with another household, team up with your neighbors. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that's a thing that islanders come across. <laughs> but... The key thing there in verse 3 is the 10th of the month, the lamb is set aside. And between the 10th and the 14th, the 14th, remember, being the day of the Passover, this is when the lamb is basically tested for any blemishes. So let's keep reading. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So again, 10th of the month, lamb set aside, checked for blemishes until the 14th, and then the twilight of the 14th, that's when um, you are meant to sacrifice this lamb. Uh, verse 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So here, we get the blood, putting it on the doorposts and the lintel, being that middle bit on the door frame. Verse 8. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So... They're roasting this meat, roasting this lamb that they had just sacrificed. Um, 
it wasn't meant to be boiled. It wasn't meant to be smoked with some oriental min marinade, anything like that. It's uh, roasted. And then it's uh, eaten for dinner along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, the unleavened bread, so leaven throughout scripture is a symbol for sin. And so the unleavened bread has that symbolism of no sin. Um, it's also used or um, related with the uh, pace in which the Israelites had to had to leave. So if you remember, sorry, I'll backtrack, backtrack a bit. Um, you have the ten plagues of Egypt. Hopefully you guys have seen Prince of Egypt or you've read through Exodus. Um, and this was... Uh, I guess the precursor to the last plague. And so the last plague was that the Lord would come and he would um, yeah, he would take the lives of the firstborn son or the fir and the firstborn of the livestock unless he saw the blood of the lamb, as we're reading through now, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. If he saw that, he would pass over um, that household to the next household. So here, once that had happened, basically, um, you see Pharaoh gets angry and wants to kill Israel. So they had to leave with great haste out of, out of the land of Egypt. And so with the unleavened bread, it also um, signifies how there's uh, not enough time to let bread rise. They had to get out real quick. Then the bitter herbs, the bitter herbs uh, symbolized the bitterness of the slavery that they were experiencing. So they had to eat that together with the, with the roast lamb. So we'll jump down to uh, verse 12. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So again, that whole piece about the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself going through and uh, killing the firstborn of the household. So that's really the origins of it. Um, and we see later in the chapter between verse 21 and 28, Moses uh, is relaying this message back to Israel um, for them to um, do this. Another key part is... Um, down in verse 46. So we'll read chapter 12, verse 46. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. So it was a key thing there that no bones of this Passover lamb was to be broken. And now, it, Passover gets expanded on. Um, Throughout Exodus, mostly in the Mosaic law, so we see in chapter Exodus chapter twenty three verses fourteen and fifteen, Passover becomes one of three feasts where uh, the Jewish males had to come, uh, had to appear before the Lord to observe the feast, um, and so that or the the place where they would have to appear would be where God chooses, and so that later becomes Jerusalem uh, with the whole temple set up. Um, and, but also while they're in the wilderness, they had the tabernacle going. So the kind of biblical practice evolved um, throughout Jewish history. Um, yeah, Deuteronomy 12 uh, verses 5 and 7 also emphasize that it's uh, specific to the location of where, where they have to practice this feast. So again... And they had to sacrifice, a, uh, set aside a lamb, 10th of Nisan, check it for blemishes up until the 14th of Nisan. At twilight, they would sacrifice that lamb, paint the doorpost and the lintel, and then roast the lamb, making sure not to break any bones, and then eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. That's essentially uh, the biblical practice of the Feast of Passover. Now, there is another feast um, that happens directly after called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we'll go through both of these uh, feasts together. So if we turn back to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 6 to 8. Uh, so verse 6, 
Then on the 15th day of the same month, so 15th day of Nisan, there is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but for seven days you shall present an offering by the fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is the holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, the origins of this feast is found in Exodus chapter 12. Um, and so we'll, we'll read through uh, verses 15 to 20. So Exodus 12 chapter 15 says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Pretty harsh. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Now right there, we see it um, at the start told us the fifteenth. And then it's telling us the 14th, and the 14th is Passover. And that's why unleavened bread and Passover is always joined together. Well, not always joined together, but joined together at different points uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, verses 1 to 8, gives us more details about the lamb that's meant to be sacrificed for Passover. And it also gives us more em emphasis on the fact that there's to be no leaven in the houses. And so the biblical practice of unleavened bread is, there's, well, the main thing is there's no leaven to be eaten uh, for seven days. And, yeah. So, basically to sum that all up, lamb killed on the 10th, uh, sorry, set aside on the 10th of Nisan, tested for blemishes up until the 14th. On the 14th, the lamb was killed at twilight. Its blood was used to paint on the doorpost and the lintel. The meat was eaten the same night during the Passover. Again, it's roasted with fire, not boiled or smoked or whatever. It's eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And then for the next seven days, no leaven was to be eaten. Cool. Now we see throughout the Bible, um, Numbers chapter 9 tells us about uh, Israel's second year in the wilderness where they uh, discuss what happens when they're unclean but they're essentially wanting to celebrate uh, the Passover so you can read that um, Joshua chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 uh, is the first time the Passover was observed in the promised land um, and then Second Chronicles chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 mentions Solomon, King Solomon uh, keeping the Mosaic law in terms of uh, sacrifices and feasts. So he's another guy that celebrated the um, Passover um, and unleavened bread. And then also Ezekiel chapter 45 verses 21 to 24, we see both feasts are in the Messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. Um, that is probably a whole other study. So send your feedback to Ronji, get him to make another video about that specifically. Um, but we'll put that on the shelf for today. Now, this was how Passover and unleavened bread was observed or practiced um, biblically. By the time uh, Jesus comes along in the Second Temple period, uh, first century in Israel, the procedure um, had developed somewhat. Um, 
but uh, essentially the the bones of it were there. Uh, there was a few additions um, that they had kind of added on to it. Now, um, also they had the temple, and so uh, everybody uh, from around the world, uh, Jewish males, they were to make their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the peace, the feast of Passover. Um, all together in Jerusalem. And so they would bring their lambs um, to the temple to be um, checked by the priests. Um, and at that time, uh, Caiaphas was the high priest, and uh, his father-in-law, Annas, was the high priest before him. And under there, they uh, did a couple of dodgy things. Um, they, so you read about in John chapter 2, Jesus goes to the temple um, as part of Passover and he is throwing the money-changing tables around and um, assessing them, basically. And one of the things that they were doing is, again, because you had to set aside this lamb on the 10th of Nisan, it had to have no blemishes. The high priests or the priests would um, maybe break an ankle or something and go, oh, sorry, guys. Your lamb's got a broken ankle. We can't use this to sacrifice for Passover. But we've got a deal for you. We've already got a whole bunch of lambs who have got the seal of approval from the priests that there's no blemishes, and we can sell that to you for a nice price. Um, and so that was the sort of thing that was uh, happening around uh, Jesus' time. Um, but we also see Jesus... Um, practice uh, or observe the Passover as well. There's four Passovers mentioned in the Bible, uh, sorry, in, in the Gospels, and we basically use that to deduce the time Jesus' ministry was. Uh, so there's four Passovers mentioned, and so his uh, ministry was about three and a half years, if you follow that. Um, yeah. But Passover in the New Testament, it's mentioned 31 times in 29 verses. Um, and then the Passover meal was now called a Seder. Seder meaning order. And there's a very specific step-by-step -step process um, to the meal. So it wasn't just eat the lamb with the bitter herbs and uh, the unleavened bread. There was uh, cups and um the Afkoman ceremony that developed. Um, there's a lamb shank bone and all these different bits and uh, pieces. And uh, we won't cover all of that extensively, but if you are interested in that, um, you can get a book called uh, the Haggadah. Oh, don't at me for my pronunciation. We'll just go with Haggadah. Um, and which basically tells you the order and all the different elements. What we will focus on um, is how Jesus is fulfilled, or how Jesus fulfilled uh, the feast of Passover and uh, the feast of unleavened bread. So, before we deep dive into that, I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter fifty-three, um, and this is one of my yeah, favorite passages. Um, yeah, it's called the the suffering servant. And so I'll read from uh, verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty, that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned around to his own way. 
but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now it goes on to say, and this is um, widely regarded um, as a messianic passage, talking about Messiah, and we saw a, a couple of those verses there very clearly talking about Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. Remember on the cross, he's pierced in his side. Um, by his scourging or by his stripes, we are healed. Um, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us all, or to wash away the sin for us all. And we see there in verse 7, Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. So already there in um, Isaiah 53, the Messiah um, is pictured as a lamb. Now, if we jump forward through to uh, John chapter 1, into our New Testament, um, John introduces, well, John, the gospel writer, <laughs> introduces uh, Jesus in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, but then later, down in uh, verse 29, um, it's John the Baptist who is talking here. And so we'll read John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So right there, John the Baptist, the forerunner, the herald to the king, is pointing Jesus out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, it's repeated again in verse 36, John the Baptist, same thing points him out as um, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Then let's read um, Revelation chapter 5, just because I like going to Revelation, add a bit of spice to these things. Um, Revelation chapter 5, and we'll read uh, verses 11 to 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every cre created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all things in them, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor, and glory and dominion, forever and ever. This is, again, the Messiah, Jesus, the only one worthy, pictured as the Lamb that was slain, or the Lamb um, who sits on the throne. He is, he is the King. So we see there Jesus pictured as the lamb, but there's heaps of lambs. Why is he the Passover lamb? So we'll kind of do a whirlwind tour through some New Testament stories, specifically the last uh, few days of Jesus' life. Now John chapter, going into John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now, six days before Passover, we see Jesus comes to Bethany. Now, back in those days, it's not safe to travel at night. They didn't have uh, fancy Mercedes like uh, Canaan um, to get through here and there. Um, they had to walk or sit on their donkey. Um, and so, yeah, it wasn't safe as well to travel during the night time because um, there's robbers and rebels and murderers and these kinds of people. So 
we can kind of see there that Jesus arrives during the daytime um, in Bethany. But we saw in verse 2, they made him a supper. So he's saying till nighttime. Now, in the Jewish reckoning of time, their day starts um, at nighttime. So basically their test was... Uh, you'd look up into the sky, as soon as you see three stars in the sky, that was the start of the new day. It's kind of a little bit confusing for us, we do midnight, um, but they didn't have um, clocks and watches back then, so they would look up to the sky, three stars, um, and that would be the start of the new day. So if Jesus is staying for dinner, that becomes the ninth of Nisan. So, sorry, six days before Passover. So if Passover is 14th, six days before is the eighth of Nisan. He's arriving during the day in Bethany. Uh, then he stays for dinner, so and then it's the ninth of Nisan. Then we see verse 12 going down the passage. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, dot, 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 the next day. So the next day after the 9th of Nisan is the 10th of Nisan. And we see there in verse 13, oh sorry, verse 12, so the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And so this is uh, Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and becomes known as Palm Sunday. And so Palm Sunday, or this triumphal entry, this is happening on the 10th of Nisan. And so that coincides with the same day that the lamb that was going to be sacrificed for the Passover was set aside. So... Jesus is being set aside um, the same day as the Passover lambs. Then if you jump across to Luke, and we'll read through Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 47 and 48. So Luke 19, 47. And so this is happening after the triumphal entry. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. And so from the 10th of Nisan until the 14th of Nisan, in that period where the lambs are being uh, checked for any blemishes, Messiah was also being tested for any blemishes. So we see the chief priests and the scribes, they're trying to trap him. Um, and there's three occasions in scripture um, that tell us where he was tested in this time. Um, and you can read them in Luke chapter 20. Um, and so We'll just do one as an example in uh, chapter 20, verses 1 to 8. Uh, basically, they ask him, by what authority uh, do you teach? And so Jesus, who didn't go to rabbi school, um, he didn't have his APA referencing down pat. Um, he, he would just read the word and interpret the word for them. Um, but he wouldn't say, oh, I know... Um, Exodus 12 means this and this because Rabbi Ronji said that blah, blah, blah. Or Rabbi Canaan says in Leviticus 23, this and that. doesn't say any of that. Jesus just interprets the word on his own. And so the, the people are, well, the scribes and the chief priests, they're trying to figure out by what authority do you do this? Um, and then he responds, was the baptism of John so John the Baptist was the baptism of John from heaven or from men. And so as the typical Jewish fashion, Jesus is using a question to answer a question. Um, but in asking this question, he trapped, he trapped them. Because if they were to say um, John the Baptist, his baptism was from heaven, then that authenticates everything that Jesus was teaching. If they say, oh no, John the Baptist, his um, baptism was from men, 
then all the crowd would get angry because they liked John the Baptist. They were, they were, some of them were baptized by John himself. So um, because they were put into this pickle, um, they didn't know how to get out of it, and they, so they just let him be. But three separate occasions, again, you can read the rest of Luke chapter 20 um, to see the different tests that, um, that they tried to trap him with. Again, finding out that Jesus he had no blemishes. He was sinless. He's, yeah, he's no, he has no sin. So, 10th to the 14th, no blemishes. Now, 14th of Nisan. So if we jump over to Luke chapter 22, um, verse 1 says, Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Um, and basically... The next little bit is when Judas decides to go and betray Jesus. He goes and um, gets some money to betray him, to betray Jesus. Uh, then if we go down to verse 7, Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Um, in verse 8, And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. So here, Jesus is wanting to observe the Passover. Again, he's sinless, so he has to observe the Mosaic law. And part of the Mosaic law, as we've seen in Leviticus 23, is observing Passover. So he tells uh, Peter and John to go and prepare it for him. Um, and if we jump down to verse 15 and 16, it says, And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat again. I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying this is his last Passover. This is the last time he's doing it. Um, until the kingdom of God. Again, it will be in the millennial kingdom. Again, ask Ronji. Um, so, on this night... Uh, again, as I said before, the rules and uh, regulations, the rituals had kind of expanded um, by this point in time. And um, yeah, so I'll ju we'll just focus on the key parts um, as mentioned in scripture. Um, but yeah, it's a whole other study um, to look at the, all these extra additions. And some of these extra additions also point towards Jesus as well. Anyway, so on this night, um, there would be four cups of wine, and each cup had its own name. Uh, they would drink two cups before the meal, and then two cups after the meal. Uh, so the first cup is known as the cup of blessing, and that begins the ceremony. So we see there, again, we're in Luke 22, verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Again, he's referencing um, this is the last time he would observe Passover until the Messianic kingdom, or until the kingdom comes. So that was the first cup known as the cup of blessing. The second cup is called the cup of plagues, um, symbolizing the ten plagues that fell upon the Egyptians. This cup's not in the Bible, not in this passage. So those are the first two cups. Then they would eat um, the meal. And part of the eating of the meal would be eating of the unleavened bread. So we see in verse 19, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's verse 19. So there we see um, Jesus took the bread. Again, it's unleavened bread. By this point in time, um, well, yeah, with the unleavened bread, again, unleavened meaning no sin, leaven being sin. And again, his body was without sin. He's identifying himself with the unleavened bread. The bread also had to be striped. Um, so Google a picture of it, <laughs> you'll see it. Um, and his body was striped. 
Uh, we see that in John chapter 19, verse 1, the scourging of his body when he's before Pilate. Um, and then the bread also had to be pierced. And again, we see his body ends up being pierced in John chapter 19, uh, verses 31 to 34. So here he's identifying himself or his body with the bread. Um, and yeah. Now verse 20 says, And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, this again, it's a new cup after the meal, and so that corresponds to the third cup in the set of four that they had to drink. And the third cup is the cup of redemption, symbolizing the blood of the Lamb that saved the Jews from the last plague, where the, where the Lord passed over the houses and didn't, um, yeah, didn't kill or take the firstborn son. So back in uh, Exodus chapter 12, um, the, the blood there um, saved them physically. Um, but now Jesus is identifying his blood with um, that same cup of redemption. But now, as we know, we are saved spiritually. Again, Jesus identifying himself um, with these parts of the Passover meal. And the Seder. Now, yeah, so that's Jesus there. Then the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, that was to start on the 15th of Nisan, so the next day. Or, so, sorry, we'll say it. So on the 14th of Nisan, that's when the lambs were sacrificed. And then that night, they would eat the um, Passover lamb. They'll eat the lamb. But again, remember Jewish reckoning of days or counting of the days. So when it went from day to night, when they saw the three stars in the sky, um, that would be the start of the new day. So the lambs were sacrificed on the 14th, but eaten on the 15th of Nisan. The same, well, this first night um, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then the next morning, that's when Jesus is crucified. Now, with the Passover, so everyone would sacrifice their Passover lamb. Um, and the next day, so the morning of the 15th of Nisan, the priests would sacrifice um, another lamb uh, called the Hagida. So Hagida. Um, and it's when the priests were sacrificing that lamb, that was the same time that Jesus was being sacrificed or crucified on the cross. And so we see the timing of the feasts and the different elements um, all coincide with what happens with Jesus. And then Jesus himself is identifying himself with the different bits of the Passover meal and ultimately um, with the Passover lamb. Now, if you still don't believe me that Jesus is fulfilling this um, feast or these two feasts, um, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll read through um, verses 7 and 8. Uh, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. Here's the kicker. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If that isn't clear, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, but ultimately, um, family, we've seen here, origins of Passover, why they um, celebrated, the Lord had told them. Again, it's part of the Mosaic Law. So every year, um, for hundreds of years, uh, over a thousand years, uh, the Israelites were told to celebrate this feast. And so every year, they're, doing, they're celebrating this feast and it's still pointing towards Jesus, still pointing towards Messiah every single time. 
again, it was to uh, commemorate or remember uh, their well, their freedom from Egypt. Uh, they got out of Egypt. Um, also, part of celebrating the feast, they were meant to teach their kids. The reason why we do this is because the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The reason why we do this is because, and so it was handed down and handed down. Now, throughout uh, the history of Israel, there are times that they were unfaithful, but um, it was yeah still commanded and yeah to the point where. Um, Jesus is their first century Israel observing this feast. And so God, again, he is um, declaring things from way back, from the beginning, about things to come, things that are going to be happening in the end, and not even in the end as well. It's in the middle and the end. Um, all throughout, God's handprint is everywhere throughout history. And so this is one of... Oh, well, two of the feasts out of the seven uh, that point towards Messiah. Again, I encourage you to uh, read these verses for yourselves and um, with prayer as well and with the leading of the Holy Spirit um, and learn these truths for yourself. Um, this is, yeah, these are the things that uh, make me love the word. I mean, if you could learn the whole thing in a day, it wouldn't be that impressive. If you could learn the whole thing in a year, would it, it would be a bit more impressive, but not that impressive. But as I've found digging into the depths of his word, there's so much foreshadowing, there's so much um, typology, there's all these different things that God's put in place that point towards his son, that point towards... Um, his plan for redemption. Um, and so on that note, I yeah, encourage you to dig into this for yourselves and uh, reach out with any questions. Um, be happy to um, help you out, but ultimately, ask God. <laughs> Thank you, family. Enjoy.